We have time for some questions. Uh, and uh, for our two final speakers, Carolyn Korsmeyer and Elizabeth Shellikens. So please, what am I seeing? Gosh, I'm, yes, you. Okay, uh, I guess this question will be more relevant to Carolyn. Um, and we talked about this as we were, you know, visiting the Auschwitz uh, exhibit. Um, but in terms of the, uh, the real thing, uh, replicas and shams, uh, to what extent is the, the, the con I mean, in situ, you know, the placement is uh, relevant because uh, Cheesecake Factory, I mean, that's completely out of context of uh, what they are, you know, trying to do. And so, um, can you elaborate on uh, the relevance of the... The degree to which the placement... Yeah. The place of, um, of course, Cheesecake Factories really do belong in malls, so they're kind of well-situated. Well, but, yeah, well, that's true. But, but you, ra you raise a question that I think is extremely important, and... I'd be curious to know what the people who work in museums think about this. It seems to me to be rather out of control because so many things that we value for being what they are, for being real remnants of the past, they are already displaced because they're in museums. On the other hand, if they weren't there, they might not be anywhere. Of course, sometimes that doesn't protect them, as this video shows. But I, I think that... <clears throat> The placement of something very much affects one's experience with it. And things about monumental ruins, like an abbey, you have to go to it. So part of that experience is your physical motion, getting there. Um, and other times they travel. A weird thing to me about the Palmyra Arch is that it moves. <laughs> um, and of, of, I mean, it's only weird if I think of it as the arch. It's not weird if I think of it as the replica that is performing a variety of functions. But um, uh, the famous picture of the arch that, in fact, I showed one of the famous places is in Trafalgar Square, where it doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the enormous Egyptian pyramid, uh, not pyramid, obelisk, that Napoleon stole from Egypt doesn't belong in Paris either, mm -hmm. but we're very used to it there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think placement is quite important. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can generalize about no. it because we encounter these things in so many different places. The socks that you showed that were darn, mm -hmm. uh, that are in a vitrine, they're behind glass in, right. the, in the Museum of Jewish Heritage downtown, down at Battery Park. Um, if they were where they belonged, they would be on a child's feet or perhaps in a, a drawer. Mm -hmm. But they have a particularly moving effect by being where they are now. Right. That's true. So uh, the answer to the question is, is the situation, is the physical placement something important? The answer is yes, but I don't think it's easy to make a, a blanket statement right. about that. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Elizabeth, but thank you both for the really interesting focus. This is a great way to finish the day. Um, why do you want to call that second kind of aesthetic value aesthetic value? Because um, it seemed like it was, I mean, you're, you're valuing the thing. It seemed much more like moral value. No, or something. And I just, so I just wondered. I'm prepared for this question. <laughs> <laughs> I have had it, had it before. I mean, um, really, of course, if you're operating with a, a conception or a definition of aesthetic value as something that is necessarily some, you know, connected with sense perception, then my problem becomes the problem of anyone who's yeah. tried to. Um, um, yeah talk of um, beauty or aesthetic value of non-perceptual objects, such as maths or chess games or science, uh, namely that you might be confusing it with something else. Uh, but to me, uh, I think it's um, so clear that the value that we experience there has a strong uh, aesthetic flavor in so far as it's, it really is, what it captures is the beauty of those things. It's the beauty of the dignity. 
uh, and the integrity of the people, for example, who have fought for that place, right? And it's it's going to be uh, a beauty which doesn't, which is, as I said, which is kind of different, both in terms of flavor and in terms of properties upon which it depends, uh, because it's because it's not about the <coughs> features. Uh, but the, I think it's. Uh, um, so it kind of, I guess, if you feel uncomfortable thinking of those things uh, as as beauty or uh, aesthetic qualities, that that certainly fits in with uh, one tradition of thinking about it. But I think there's another strong tradition which has tried to make sense of things like the beauty of the soul. Right? Uh, I mean, look at Plotinus. Uh, in, in fact, if you start looking at the most Kind of the original classic cases uh, of beautiful experiences, you won't find things that are things that you can look at and touch. You will, you will find much more abstract entities which seem to invite um, an appreciation in aesthetic terms. So it becomes a question of, as I said, how far you are willing to kind of stretch uh, the concept of the aesthetic. But I, I find that there is a real, there, there's no better way to to think about um, all those evaluative qualities coming together in a place like Palmyra, many other examples, than in terms of, of the beauty. Both, uh, as I said, in terms of the positive features that feed into that value and the negative ones. It, seem, sorry, it seems to me that a term that, that neither of you used in describing uh, ruins and and uh, the related structures, uh, related things. Uh, you use the term Elizabeth beauty, but there's no mention of sublimity as another aesthetic quality, if you like. Or, or, uh, and ruins are often described in terms of the sublime. And I wondered if you had any, either of you had anything to say about the sublime in relation to. It. I actually mentioned it because I quoted Wordsworth. <laughs> I didn't make a big deal of it. Largely because, now let's see, why did I not? Um, because I, um, largely because I didn't want to get diverted into the more traditional aesthetic categories. It's so recognizable. And I think the question of the reproducibility of something pertains to objects, whether they are sublime or beautiful or curiosities or quaint or I, 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 I think that one thing, I don't know if Elizabeth would agree to that, but there's an expanded notion of beauty that um, older theorists like Bosenkett would call difficult beauty. And it isn't pretty, it isn't formally beautiful, but there's a depth to it that um, it can include sublimity, it can include terror. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but, but I think there you have something very grand. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the issues that we've been talking about here also pertain to the, the familiar and the small, mm -hmm. such as Yuriko's examples. And that was why I avoided sublimity, why don't you avoid sublimity? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't consciously uh, avoid it. I think it, uh, and I would certainly be open to uh, reflecting on how that term might best be applied in those kind of cases. But I, I mean, in my example, the way I thought about it when I thought in terms of, of courage, integrity, um, uh, dignity, it seems to me that beautiful is closer to hand, uh, at least in, in some cases. But, uh, but there is no principled reason why I would think of it in terms of sublimity sometimes. Yeah. I have a, quest, a question for both of you, and that circles back to some other conversations we've had today. Um, and um, Elizabeth, in your talk, it, the, it was your second aspect of, of beauty, the, the sort of individual object that triggered this in, in me and Carolyn. It was um, the notion, um, uh, the need for recognition of reference in certain cases. And both, both of those strike, to, uh, strike me as invoking uh, the need for a certain kind of knowledge that accompanies a perceptual experience um, in order to sort of round out an aesthetic experience in a particular kind of direction. And, and that, made me, that made me want to sort of ask a question that brings sort of conservation practice back on the table, which is how, how does one approach conservation 
of a material, even if one takes aesthetic criteria in mind, in the absence of certain kinds of knowledge about it? Can you treat the object properly in a vacuum of knowledge? Because certainly conservators have to treat all sorts of objects with variable amounts of conditional knowledge about what it is. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that, that kind of that relationship. <laughs> well, uh, I can't really speak for uh, conservatives. Uh, conservatives do or don't do, but uh, I think I mean the short answer would be no. At least if you have an ideal sense of what conservation should be about in mind, as you say, I'm sure there are many, many cases where our knowledge is so partial, or perhaps pretty much inexistent, uh, that you have to um, use derivative knowledge, perhaps of similar kind of cases, or perhaps artifacts created at roughly the same time or something like that. So that must be a hugely difficult process of puzzling together uh, relevant pieces of knowledge or information to form some kind of picture uh, uh, which can create for that kind of respectful environment in which uh, an object can be conserved or restored in the best possible way. Uh, but I, I hugely admire people who, who have to face that kind of uh, difficulty in their work. I'd like to divide, to, to suggest that maybe that question needs to be taken apart. Um, first of all, on the issue of uh, needing background cognition, absolutely. I, there, th this gets into some very um, controversial and dense theories of perception. There are lots of theorists today, psychologists, philosophers, and others, who... Um, speculate about the degree to which perception does or does not require cognition. There, there's a, a common term as cognitive penetrability. But I started avoiding that term a while ago because the arguments about cognitive penetrability distinguish between what they call low-level and high-level mm -hmm. perception, low-level being red or something like that. And when we're talking about very complex objects, as any work of art, any cultural artifact is, it's never low level. And it seems to me that one's understanding of the identity of the object has to affect the way you are seeing it. Actually, my question to Elizabeth is, why is the second kind of beauty non-perceptual? Because it seems to me there's a high level of perception. With regard to conservation, um, I, I guess there are two ways that it, that, that question might be parsed. One is, what does the conservator need to know in order to treat the object correctly? But the other is, if the goal of conservation is to present an object to the public, the visiting public, what do they need to have a, in their fund of understanding so that they can see the thing in its proper way? Um, that seems to be like two different enterprises. Is that right? <laughs> we'll be in the museum. Related ones, but but I would I'd separate them. I think. Uh, I, <coughs> yes. Um, I had a, uh, first of all, I, I endorse the idea of not using the sublime in this context. I mean, even though Longinus was from Palmyra, it seems to me that uh, typically the, uh, the sublime is used to talk about the cessation of thought or the inability to think through it. It seems your <coughs> argument is that uh, you want thought to be attached to the aesthetic judgments about Palmyra. That makes tons of sense. It did strike me that the argument about Palmyra, the two poles were, were sort of um, aesthetics and ethics. And um, unfortunately, I think you have to put in politics into that as well. I think it might shift a little bit. I mean, you know, um, why are we paying attention to this particular ruin it, uh, and this attack on cultural heritage it's really purely a political question, right? We know that right now, you know, the, 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 the Uyghur culture is being wiped out, the, the Kurds are in trouble. We, we know perfectly well that there are other situations that are actually much more actively at risk for cultural heritage. I, I'm not sort of a, a, I'm not judging our focus on this. I also work on this, so I'm, I'm just I'm just curious what would happen if we thought about the the politics of attention that makes us focus on this event, and which in fact is what, as we know, uh, ISIS wanted us to do, right? They staged it that way. And so we're, um, 
So I wonder how, how that folds in. Right now, you're, you're, it's about forms of attention, your, your, your treatment, and, and how maybe looking at the beautiful thing might make us more ethical, and how thinking about the ethical might make us more engaged with the, with the beautiful. But there does be a missing piece. Is that unfair to say? Well, I mean, I, I think um, I certainly didn't mean to. I mean, I, I did kind of allude to kind of a more kind of geopolitical, social kind of context. I couldn't really go into that so much. Uh, of course, there are issues to do with why, why, why is this, uh, why is this example, why, why has this case become the kind of the epitomized case that we discuss uh, and, and not others? And in a way, you know, those are kind of socio. There are socio-political reasons for that, and some of them are good, some of them are bad. <laughs> uh, but uh, that that can be taken into account, of course. Uh, uh, but I didn't want to build that in necessarily to the story of how we should um, think about the moral and historical dimensions um, uh, in terms of its aesthetic uh, character uh, for, for my project. But it's not that they're not there and that I'm not aware of them or um, that they can't play as an important part. But I don't see it quite so much as part of the of the kind of the the triad because in a way it's a uh, it's an external uh, kind of coincidental um, situation when I'm trying to look at the object itself. If you, if you see what I mean. Well, I mean, yeah. think about it. I, I was at a talk on on the preservation of objects, and more time, and one of the curators who was speaking pointed out that as we were discussing these issues around around Syria, uh, you know, in India right now, all kinds of historic wells are being destroyed. That we, you know, so it it, it, it does seem like that it's not it's it's. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's a fantastic project to try to connect these things. I'm just wondering. I'm trying to think. Wonder for you, you can you can amplify it. That's all. I'm not trying to make it seem that it's small, but I wonder if you can make it bigger somehow. Absolutely. But one thing I've learned from looking at these cases is that there is not one one story, one narrative that's going to fit all these cases. And I began by saying that our normative phenomenology is very messy here. We do tend to, to kind of lump all these cases together. The Benin bronzes, the Cesar Road statue, the Elgin model, model the Theramos bridge. <laughs> Why not fit in the Temple of Bell also? I think each case needs to be looked at very carefully. I think the kinds of value that ought to be ascribed to each case are different. And, uh, you know, my distinction between um, the beauty of that which meets the eye, to, to use an expression that Karen used, and the beauty that I think is the one that, that lasts, the one that we kind of keep with us from our experience, or if not just the reflections on, on these kind of cases, uh, might not apply to all of those cases in the same kind of way. Um, so I'm very sensitive to those distinctions. In fact, I've I've written about the importance of, of not lumping all those cases together. So, but thank you for bringing that to our attention in this discussion. I think we have time for one last question. I'll be very quick. Actually, two short questions. First is on recognition and somewhat following up from Aaron's question. Just to, to complicate things a little bit, it strikes me that the case of ruins is actually a really good case study in the absence of recognition, since for most of the time that these objects were attractive to people, people didn't really know what they were. And so it becomes this complicated case where, on the one hand, the actual, we might say, uh, antiquarian knowledge of the thing is lost, but the recognition, there's a different kind of recognition that comes in that fills it. And so the Tintern Abbey would be a great example of that. Right? It's not a kind of deeply historical, archaeological knowledge of the thing that keeps ruins attractive and attentive to people. There's some other kind of knowledge that's filling in. And you know, the question of how that would work for a conservator, I'll just leave open. Uh, and the second question for Elizabeth, just when you got to the end, really, and uh, you know, like Rilke, the Drino allergies, you find an obligation that we have to the things. At that point, you are uh, showing such respect to the things. I'm wondering, does it lead to the question of how what happens when obligations to things come into conflict with obligations to people? Did you, should I, do you want to begin by saying I'll start with recognition, because yeah. that was the first question. Um, I, I certainly agree with, with what you say. What, what I was stressing with recognition for the purpose of understanding degradation is that you don't see something as degraded unless you recognize it has having been caused by some just degrading event, whether it's um, deliberate damage or wear and tear. Um, I also believe, by the way, this is not something I said, but I think it fits with what you were saying about 
the level of recognition one need, whether it's antiquarian precision or just a kind of vague, this used to be here and it was our ancestors or something like that, or it was something like space aliens left it here because some of these things are seen to be that way. I won't say recognized to be that way because recognition implies correct grasp, and, but, I, but I believe we can make aesthetic mistakes. We can be deceived, and when we learn that we were, our perception of things often changes. Um, I was glad you mentioned Wilka, so you <laughs> can finish off this question. Okay, well, I'll, and I think that it's, uh, I mean, we've seen plenty of cases recently of people who have, um, you know, uh, put their physical safety second uh, mm -hmm. in order to be able to protect cultural heritage. I mean, many <laughs> people just in the kind of instances that we refer to yes. in our talks uh, uh, have given their lives to protect these objects. So then there is a sense in which at least uh, people who are involved <laughs> uh, in that kind of, at that kind of level uh, will see our obligations or our duties to preserve these objects as bigger um, than their own individual lives. Uh, uh, it's interesting to, to note that after um, after the taking or the damaging, if you like, of, of human life, the destruction of cultural heritage is the second most serious crime um, that you can commit uh, according to international uh, law in, in armed conflict, right? Uh, so I think that's a ranking that that uh, reflects most of our um, intuitions. But that's not to say that if you were the person who were in that situation and this is an object or a site that embodies uh, not just your cultural or religious values, but generations uh, from your community that you <coughs> might make the same decision. But I think that must be a decision uh, made by <laughs> the person themselves. So I think in that kind of situation, the uh, international um, uh, code of... Um, code is, is, is correct that of course life has to come first before artifacts in that way. Yeah. Doesn't it also no, go ahead. doesn't this also set up some very familiar horrible dilemmas mm -hmm. such as do you warn the people of Canterbury that it's going to yeah. be bombed or yeah. do you preserve the cathedral? Mm -hmm. I mean or mm -hmm. I don't have that right but you know those those examples where preserving cultural heritage means um, not informing people that they should leave or something like that. Um, so those are awful questions to have to deal with. Well, we'll stop thinking about the most difficult things for just a few minutes while we thank our two final speakers for their presentations. <laughs> We'll have a brief pause while we do a little rearrangement, um, and I'm going to ask Anne to sit on that side in, the pl in Francesca's place. I should explain Francesca had to leave for, for childcare, uh, and I'll sit on that side so that we're a little bit more open. Um, we have not, uh, we have not, we didn't get as far as figuring out how we're going to run the final, uh, relatively brief wrap-up discussion, but. We'll move pretty good at that, so we'll move. Oh, yes, which I'm so excited I always feel that. Like, yeah. so so yeah. 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 I think that works quite well. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> So the ceiling mics are on, so everyone can be heard uh, and far and wide. And we have we have a few minutes. We'll wait until uh, an alarm bell goes when we know that the, that the line is out there. And uh, maybe that's in five minutes. Maybe it's in fifteen minutes. I'm not sure, but we'll we'll see. Uh, and so. Everyone around this table, I know, has at some point in their careers been asked 
to summarize an entire workshop, uh, <laughs> to make uh, go through the points and, and pick the salient, uh, salient uh, points that have been made during the day. And so I'm going to nominate that, no, I'm not going to nominate anyone to do this, because it's not, it wouldn't be fair. And I'm not going to try to do it myself. But what I'm going to do is to invite everyone who's participated to uh, reflect on the, the points that strike them as having been most surprising, most useful for their own way of thinking, uh, most, uh, perhaps, What's another term I can use for this? That they would like to follow up in their own thinking and reading and discussion. Uh, so I just just one just one or two points, and I'd like to just do that going round round the table uh, among the speakers to begin with. And this is not to put anyone on the spot. It's really just what is struck. What what's the thing that really struck you in the course of the presentations and the discussion? today and also yesterday in the workshop in the lab at the Museum of Modern Art. So I think we should begin at random, right in the middle with Sherry. Okay. I think, so something that has, that I've kind of pulled out from starting with Eric's talk at the end, ending with Elizabeth's talk, uh, or at the beginning, not the, not the beginning. <laughs> ending with Elizabeth's talk, also picking out some things that Francesca and Jeffrey discussed, and also some discussions we had yesterday in our workshop um, in the MoMA Conservation Labs, is really this question, like, for whom? When we're undertaking conservation efforts, for whom or for what are they undertaken? And um, I think that my sense of that question has deepened a lot um, over these two days. Um, thinking about... Um, on, the, on the one hand, you've got the artist who's expressing some things about the integrity and the identity of the artwork, and some of those things are sort of captured in documents, and some of them don't quite make their way into the documents, and nonetheless, the artist has a sense of the integrity of the artwork that they still want to have respected. And I think some of the cases in the Ponza collection really capture that very well. But also, there are, you know, a sense of kind of connections to past communities and cultures from which these artifacts came and in which they participated in important ways and to what extent do we owe a debt to the past and to past communities to accurately represent and bring forward their heritage. But then there's also the future audiences, of course, who it's very obvious to think about, but I feel like we've had some discussions about how the expectations of future audiences about the nature of preserving the integrity can really change. And we've had some really concrete discussions about that, like, um, you know, c can you cut off the cores of lamps, you know, like, oh, that, that kind of, we don't really have that kind of fixture anymore, we'll just cut that off and throw that away and put, and then future audiences may be like, no, 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 <laughs> like, no, we want it to have the integrity, we, we have a different sense of what is required for integrity. And so it's hard to be beholden to the expectations of future audiences, but um, it does seem like there's an important way that we need to kind of be, have a broad scope of what they might value when we're thinking about what we do now. Great, thanks, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey, can I ask you to <coughs> just a brief reflection? Sure, sure. Um, I guess um, what, partly what struck me is I'm always trying to kind of bring this back to, um, bring conversations like this back to uh, to um, kind of life on the ground yeah. with respect to, um, to museum practice, for example, and, you know, art historical practice and critical practice, too, uh, but, but perhaps focusing on the museum today, um, you know, the, is, what strikes me is the, uh, the way in which um, the frame of reference will influence, the changing frame of reference will influence the, the way in which we address the same thing as it moves from place to place, its mobility, in within the culture and across time, um, has a um, has a has a way of changing what of the changing the choices we might make on its behalf. Because so that's something that I think a lot about in relation to the to the Ponza project, but also that I draw from um, you know that I that I I look to other disciplines uh, from which to draw um, that will kind of defamiliarize the problem yes. in relation to to what I do do at the museum. So the fact that it exists out in the world in multiple other ways, which I've been kind of encountering today, 
uh, is something that I will, you know, try to use in in a, in a self-critical way when we go back to the, you know, to, 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 to see this place. To cite. That sounds very positive to me. That's great. It's it's uh, uncharacteristically for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeffrey. Now. Anne and I are not going to exempt ourselves from, from this little exercise, so Anne, what? We're not. We're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, there's so many things I want to say. They're just, I feel really, um, this was, these conversations were so rich, and I am taking so much back with me to Chicago. I'm really grateful for all of that. Um, I, one of the things that really interests me is um, and this is, I think this is kind of picking up on what Jeffrey was just talking about. But there was um, a kind of tension between what some of you were talking about that involved a really, um, I'm not sure how to put it, strong form of authorial um, intention and respecting that and control over the object and consulting with, it's, you know, started yesterday in the lab, mm -hmm. consulting the artist and the artist is the final arbiter of all of this stuff on the one hand and the sorts of things that, um, for instance, um, excuse me, Professor um, Hamda and Professor Saito were talking about, um, you know, where, where there's where you're thinking about an object having a life and you're really respecting and celebrating the various changes that it might have. Mm -hmm. And I really like it that we sort of ended up in this place, because there was this question that, that you and I have been wanting to ask for a long time, and it's, it's one that um, Michelle, Mary, Michelle brought up in her questions today, and I mean her comments today that I thought were really helpful about the distinction between thinking about the points that y'all were making, um, do we want to distinguish between kinds of damage and degradation and value that are unsalutary in some way and those that we want to celebrate and respect and so forth? And I feel like we, surely Elizabeth gave us examples of ones that we don't um, want to celebrate or endorse. And I felt like um, you were also giving us um, some, Michelle, uh, other, other sorts that, that, just to think about like, ways in which this isn't a positive phenomenon, whether morally or aesthetically or something. So, so that changes over time, because when yeah. stop gaps and windows were put in, they were it was a, a functional decision because right. windows keep out the weather. Right. So you close the window. Right. So And then it, it shifts into an aesthetic object, and there's an aesthetic effect. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's it's... Yeah. We're, we're trying to trap this in time now, and for conservators it's critical because we need to work on the object now. So, um, or we might be asked to work on the object now, so we're trying to parse these things, but it, it is a moving picture, which everyone has said. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, we've been joined at the table by my colleague, Professor uh, Jennifer Mass who is our Professor of Science of Cultural Heritage. So I want to give her the option of, uh, of making some remarks, but with no, obli no obligation to do so. I'd be delighted. I don't want to try and summarize the entire wonderful day, but the one thing that really stood out to me was from Remiko, actually, when you were talking about the concept of um, submission and resignation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I felt like there was so much Taoism in uh, those terms, mm -hmm. in terms of if you read the Tao Te Ching and you think about being a rock in the stream that's going to be have its edges rounded by being in the stream. And it's such a profoundly anti-capitalist notion. I feel like mm -hmm. in the West, we very much want to jump in there and fix things. And the idea of submitting to decay is something that I'm definitely going to be thinking about a lot in the future and how that really um, relates to, um, we don't typically, well, maybe more and more we're starting to think of capitalism as a uh, religion in the West. And uh, so that dynamic that you set up in terms of not only submission and resignation, but delusion and deception, <laughs> I thought was fascinating in terms of, my God, are we all deluding ourselves in terms of, as professionals in conservation, we do um, in some ways delude ourselves that art is forever, and at what point should we um, start to realize our limitations? So I thought there were some wonderful points brought up there. Great, thank you. I'd like to just add to that that um, this question of the of 
addressing the, the de you know, decay or the death of the object is something that um, is, is common, perhaps in settings like this, but completely alien to the, to the museum as an institution, mm -hmm. yes. completely and yeah. totally alien. Yes. It has no, it cannot even be a topic of, of debate in my experience without, yes. mm -hmm. you know, um, and that, that that too is is something that I would like to bring back to. I'm always trying to get more of the museum people into places like this, or to bring more of you back to that setting because um, there is still a bit of a firewall yeah. between the two worlds, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. which I regret as mm -hmm. a professional. We try to break that down you in this institution, great, not just today. It's uncommon. And, yes, no, I know. But, Every day we try to break that down. Programming, yes. 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 Yeah. Have a permeable, have the permeability. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but it stays, it stays sort of seminarial in a way, yes. you know, and, and what I would like to see more of is, is actual, you know, conversation about how to turn that into, how to let the, the, yes. those questions, those difficult questions inform the choices that are made yes. at the museum, you yes. know, philosophically speaking. Yeah. So I'm going to take Chair's privilege of jumping the line. Uh, I'm going to come back to Eric. I haven't forgotten about you there because the remark that I would like to make briefly uh, pertains, follows on directly from Jeffrey's, which concerns what we see on the screen here mm -hmm. this wonderful Egyptian uh, figure of a high general, uh, which is uh, partly uh, identifiable by an inscription on the, on the back. Mm -hmm. uh, when this was acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, just, I think, within the last relatively few years, I can't remember exactly when, sometime in the late 90s, uh, it, was, there was, it, it was a big acquisition. It was published. There was an issue of the Metropolitan Museum's bulletin devoted to it. And I read the entire issue, fascinating, uh, the curators, conservators discussing it, not one mention of its state. <laughs> Not one mention. <laughs> and Adam and I picked this uh, because it seems to us that this is a perfect, a perfect example of how damage actually enhances the aesthetic qualities, mm -hmm. uh, proper, the qualities of a thing. Mm -hmm. It's so much more compelling. Yeah. You don't agree, Jim, I can see. <laughs> It's just that everybody gets to fill in the gap themselves, and that's yeah. an aesthetic response. Right. Not, yes. not it's the thing a, itself. Right. Yeah. It's it's but it, it allows us to to work with it in a way that would not be possible were it pristine. That's not to say that it's it's uh, that in its pristine state it wouldn't have worked being something that we could have worked with aesthetically, not at all. But that as it is, it has inadvertently. Uh, a, uh, a presence that it wouldn't have if it were pristine. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's following on from Jeffrey's point that the museum, in its publication, entirely ignored this. And that's something that I regret. I don't criticize our colleagues in, in the Metropolitan Museum for ignoring this. It just seems to me to be worthy of remark, if you like, and symptomatic of a a, a selective attention, and the selective attention that excludes the kind of attention that we've been trying to bring to this set of puzzles uh, over the last two days. I'll leave it at that and turn it to the character. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, just continuing on this theme, really, I think the thing that I'm going to sort of leave thinking most about is, uh, is the institutional constraints that, mm -hmm. that Jeffrey brought up. And I started thinking about this yesterday, really, um, when we were at, at MoMA, um, when we were, you know, in light of the the works that were under discussion, you know, we asked or someone asked, you know, sort of, well, why, why even conserve this thing? And Roger was like, well, we have contracts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he said, "I was like, what does that word mean?" What an yeah. answer that was. Oh, right. Yeah, it was yeah. and sorry, what was the word? Litigious. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, on the one thing, I want to. One hand, I want to think more about you know the the on the ground situation and sort of how we negotiate these questions in the light of these institutional facts and constraints. But then it also makes me think more about the need for newer, different kinds of institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're good. OK. Well, my biggest takeaway is that I am glad I'm not in conservation business. <laughs> 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 it's too 
more difficult. <laughs> but the other way of uh, to, uh, saying the same thing is that, uh, you know, it uh, just uh, developed tremendous respect for what conservators have to deal with on a day, day-to-day basis. And um, uh, over lunch, um, you know, you, we were talking about the notion of visibility and invisibility, uh, which was part of my talk uh, regarding repair, but more importantly, um, conservator's work um, is literally invisible because uh, people do not come to the museum to see conservators at work, right? They are coming yes, to see... Do. Uh, it does happen from time to time. Oh, well, yeah, yes, but, but I mean, generally it's, it's speaking. usually, you know, yeah, they one. come to see the sculpture painting and, yep. and so on. Um, and, um, and also, uh, their work uh, would have to be, in one sense, invisible. Mm. Right? So you don't, I mean, sometimes you have to do visible repair, mm. uh, but uh, most of the time, I think mm. that default position is invisible uh, repair, mm. so that uh, um, y- the, the mark of a repair sh- should not be like glaring. Um, and so this notion of visibility and invisibility uh, really fascinate me, and mm. I, it's, um, I think, worthy of my personal exploration. Um, and um, and also the, the fact that I mean this goes back to uh, Yukele's work uh, about maintenance uh, art um, that uh, care um, work related to care uh, which conservators do that you know that's your job um, that is also not really like recognized as in many other maintenance care work um, so so I it, it just struck me as. Um, uh, what's the word, um, needs more um, recognition, respect, and um, recognized status. And one more takeaway is that um, it, since starting yesterday with the um, uh, that, you know, museum uh, MoMA talk, uh, there was this notion of care all the time, you know, mm-hmm. that, um, you know, conservators are caregiver, you know, mm-hmm. you are caring for the object. And, um, and then uh, Elizabeth says, um, with the uh, heritage cycle, was it? One of the things, you know, uh, was understanding and uh, that was, I can't remember the next one. But, but the third one was uh, caring. Um, so uh, there is something in there regarding care. Um, and um, uh, I think my particular concern doing everyday aesthetics is that um, consumer culture got so bad that we don't care about objects. Right. And so, you know, disposables. And so we don't do repair, we don't do maintenance work. And then the first sign of a scratch or whatever, well, you know, it's cheap enough. I chuck it and then I get the next one. So, um, so I think that um, in a way, uh, conservation work is um, a model for how to restore our caring relationship, respectful relationship with the material world. Um, that, uh, you know, it, it, um, it's, um, it, it, should be, uh, it should be careful. Wonderful, thank you. Nomiko, <laughs> <laughs> your thoughts. Okay. Um, I'm not a very quick thinker. And at this point, of right after this um, um, interesting talks of people, if I use a lot of words, I don't think I will make sense. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to say a few words. Mm-hmm. So one thing that I want to think about is the extent of authorship. Mm-hmm. So authorship resides in individual is one thing, but authorship residing in a culture is another thing, and authorship residing in the world, or the, what, the, what is the time span, the author's lifetime time span versus, you know, continuous uh, uh, world of time of the world as, as, as span. So I'm just putting it as extent of authorship, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what would that be? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying there is one singular answer to it, but I don't think we should think that there is one singular answer to it. Maybe that's the point. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the second one is the meaning of heritage. Maybe it's related to the first one, but... um, so, you know, heritage 
I think involves the past as well as, the, I mean past and the present. It's not just the past. So when we think about heritage, not only we have to think about the past, what happened and, and what it meant, but also what it means at the present and probably to the future. So that's that. And, and all that maybe, you know, uh, since we're talking about art objects, you know, art as living heritage. So um, if you, we put uh, art into uh, some sort of a capsule, you know, this comes from such and such location of the earth and from such and such time period, um, maybe in Miku's sense, it is the death of the art object. Mm -hmm. In order to maintain the life of art object, probably we need to think of, of you know, art as living heritage. It, it keeps living. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. And I think some of what you said there chimes very well with what Jess was saying this morning about conservators. The, uh, the, the emphasis in discussion is so often on the thing as it was in the past. And what Jess, as a practicing conservator, brought out was the idea of, of the conservator thinking of the future, mm -hmm. the future of these things. And that's, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, you knew I was getting to you sooner. I was, I was. And, uh, I also I find it difficult so early now. I just kind of just at the end of all the papers to to summarize my thoughts. I'm sure I'll I'll, I'll carry much more with me. Uh, so if you ask me in a week, I'll say something more uh, interesting that I can say now. But um, something that followed me from yesterday into today um, is is the um, sense of difficulty of pinpointing the aim of conservation and. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I learned a lot from our afternoon yesterday at the MoMA and the brutal honesty <laughs> uh, um, of, the, of those who, who work for conservation there uh, in terms of what it is they are aiming to do and what conservation might look like and the huge sensitivity um, uh, in, 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 in relation to each particular case or artwork or, or piece. Um, I mean, I had spoken to some people who work with conservation at my own university. We have a very extensive uh, university collection, most of which is uh, as a result of what well, is kind of war booty, really, <laughs> brought back to Sweden from Germany or various other uh, European places, uh, but also more widely. And uh, I had had conversations about um, the kind of conflicts or the clashes of cultural traditions in terms of conservation. And at our university, we have repatriated various objects to parts of the world uh, at huge expense after many years of huge expense and work to keep these artifacts, which then on arrival at their original um, um, uh, place <laughs> or country uh, uh, were not destroyed as such, but were left to be reunited with nature or kind of in some respect, um, you know, a, a, a totally different sense of, of conservation, not, not a material conservation as such, but some kind of return uh, to, to something immaterial, <laughs> if you like. Uh, and so we, I discussed those kind of clashes, but I hadn't uh, the benefit of, of um, having conversations with people in conservation uh, about the uh, perhaps the underlying anxiety or questions or doubts um, uh, that come with what it is one does uh, and how one does it best. So I thought that that was really enriching. The idea of that kind of heading into the unknown when you start conserving something was something I hadn't quite got from my previous conversations. And um, I also got some great examples of artworks. I love some of the examples that we've seen in, our, in the talks today, and I, I think I'll, I'll try to think about them more carefully. And, uh, and the final thing I wanted to say something about was that um, uh, it's made me think, I think I will think more carefully about the notion of how a lot of art plays on its own temporality and how it kind of reflects or perhaps teases out our temporality. 
uh, not just art that plays on the decay aspect, but just art in general, uh, the capturing of a moment, but the kind of awareness that nothing can be conserved forever, mm -hmm. and and uh, how you know how it invites us to to reflect uh, uh, about that. I think that's something that's kind of come come more become more um, um, concrete in my mind. Yeah, thank you, mm -hmm. Carol. I'm an even slower thinker. It's very hard for me to um, digest everything that has occurred and, and come up with kernels of what I take away. But um, in, in Peter's opening remarks, you referred to ancient objects. You showed the big picture of fragments of ruins as time's markers. Was that your term? Which is one of the things that I value about old things. Mm -hmm. But I realized that when I was giving my own presentation, I was talking about the real thing as though that was just an identifying concept. But of course, it's a value concept. And it's extremely difficult to really be confident about the selection of the real thing that's worth keeping, mm -hmm. or even the aspect of it that makes it worth keeping. And the fact that things last so much longer than we do, unless they are fungus or something like that. But you know, the kinds of material, of stone and metal, they do deteriorate, they do chip away. But an interesting thing about artifacts is they tend to hang around much, much longer than any human life, which means that the people, as us today, who are thinking about them and projecting what we should do with them, we're bound to be working with such partial understanding, um, which is very humbling for those who are positively about it, but it spreads everywhere. How do you know what to save from your attic? Yes. Um, or your own past? Um, or your, <laughs> if you've had children, then you probably know that their stuff accumulates and it's very hard to get rid of because Mm -hmm. Sandu, somebody had a, a, a sentiment. Who, who talked about sentimentality? A category of sentimentality. We mentioned it at the beginning. Yes. Anne and I mentioned it. Oh. Yes. I think that's a very important factor. Mm -hmm. But it's also very unstable. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And um, I guess what I'm taking away is a perpetual sense of humility about this ongoing project. Mm -hmm of dealing with things that degrade and, and last. Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I think now might be the time to, if you could broach what we discussed briefly earlier about bibliography and... and oh, yeah, it was, it was a suggestion that Michelle made when we were talking about... Um, am I getting your name right? You are. Okay. It was oh, okay. me who suggested it, but it's a great oh. idea. <laughs> <laughs> It, it was used. We it was a conversation. It was a conversation. It was a joy. Joy suggested it. It was a suggestion that Joy made. I'm sorry about that. Um, which is that we might come up with uh, like a website. We can make a, a, a site. Of, and anybody who would be um, willing to share their PowerPoint with others and maybe even their papers. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if, if y'all noticed this, but from the very beginning, you know, Alva was over there with his phone taking pictures of the slides because, like, he wanted to, you know, remember these things. And so I thought we could just, you know, if you want to, um, make your PowerPoints and your papers available, and then we could also come up with a bibliography. And so, so here are the two things you might do. Um, if you want to share your paper, it, um, that would be great. If you want to share your PowerPoint, that would be great. And then you could also send um, to me, I'm happy to collect them, um, any like bibliography you've referred to. It might be just you know your book um, or something that you've mentioned. And I would invite the audience to do that too. And so maybe I'll just make my email address available and I could collect these things and then we could have because there's so many references to wonderful things that have gone by. I mean, you, if you wanted to say a little something about it, go ahead or not. I mean, that would be helpful, but you don't have to. The PowerPoint that. is already, I mean, collected, right? Oh, no, but, but also, yes. all the presentations yes. will be online. Yes. Edited. Yes. 
and available. Well, so the idea is that you would this this would be something so that somebody wouldn't have to um, watch, watch the, video. the whole thing again. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they would search for you know you showed this slide of something. I want to go find yeah. that one slide. Um, Could I ask a question about that? This came up recently at another place where I gave a talk and was asked to submit my PowerPoints, mm -hmm. some of which I took from people who like, I paid for the image. Uh, like, right. I it. yes. And it's yeah. not the payment, I'm worried about yes. it. But it's the ownership, it's the rights. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. you do that? I mean, they're not, I presume they would be presented in a degraded way so that they couldn't be printed mm -hmm. properly, but right. is that a problem? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's something we can, we can, we can, do, yeah. we can maybe address here and find, get the right advice. And not do anything yeah. that is that is okay. uh, contravention yeah. of copyright. This is why, by the way, I said if you want to share, if you feel like you can yes. share your part. Well, I think they're, and it, it's odd because the images are readily findable usually on the web. Yes. Mm -hmm. But still, if you publish them, yes. there's an owner, and I don't yes. know where this where putting things on websites okay. counts. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Yeah. I don't know that we'd be able to put it on a website, but I think we'd be able to make things available. On request or something, we can we can figure this out. Something. But I think. But the bibliography. Yes. We could put together. I think that would be great. Yeah. yeah. So, um, is there a way for me to make my email address available right now to people? I mean, I can say it out loud. <laughs> that would be hard to write it down. How could we? For, for if, so because if the audience had things that you know there have been um, works that you've mentioned or things that you think you'd like to share with other people. Um, you could write to me. You all have to confine For example. Yes, so why don't you? Well, I'll just do this then. If you care to send me some bibliography that I could share with everyone, my email address is eaton at uic dot edu. E-A-T-O-N. I think a couple of mine would be as well. That's just my last name. At uic I don't know. dot edu. And I'll collect them, and then we can make. Uh, that was a good idea, Joy. Really. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. I could tell. I'd like to come full circle, and in concluding, uh, in thanking first of all, thanking everyone who's participated mm -hmm. in this amazing event. Everyone who's come. <laughs> Reiterating thanks to those who made this possible through all their hard work in Bard Graduate Center uh, today and at the Museum of Modern Art in the Objects Lab yesterday. And also uh, coming around to thinking of, our, of how this is part of a larger project of our cultures of conservation. I see at the back uh, Abigail Chowdhury from the Mellon Foundation. <laughs> and so I just want to reiterate the thanks that Peter made at the beginning of the day to the Mellon Foundation because without the financial support of the Mellon Foundation, none of this would have been possible. So thank you very much.